50 years ago, the developmental psychologist Walter Michel conducted an ingenious experiment with preschoolers, and the design was simple. His assistants had each of the preschoolers, whose average age was four and a half years old, enter a room and sit at a table. Then they were given a choice. They could have one marshmallow immediately, or two marshmallows if they could wait about 15 minutes. As you watch this video, you may feel impulses to look at your phone or click on another link, but test yourself. See if you can stay with me. It'll be worth it. And you won't have to wait much longer than the preschoolers had to wait for their marshmallows. So why does it matter if the kids were able to wait 15 minutes? Well, this is a measure of their inhibitory control and their ability to delay gratification. Michelle and his colleagues found that when they caught up with these kids 10, 20, 30 years later, the children who were better able to delay gratification were doing better socially, academically, and occupationally than those who weren't as able to delay gratification. They had better SAT scores, earned higher degrees, and held more stable jobs. So good things really do come to those who wait. These correlations point to continuity and development, but obviously waiting 15 minutes for a marshmallow doesn't cause better educational attainment. But the ability to delay gratification, which helps a four-year-old wait 15 minutes for an extra marshmallow, also helps a 14-year-old focus on their homework rather than look at their phone every time it buzzes. And the ability to delay gratification also helps a 24-year-old inhibit the impulse to hit the bars with her friends when she knows that she needs to study for her MCAT exam. And our long-term success is usually the product of a lot of short-term choices. And this is true of our ability to develop athletic talent, or any talent for that matter. To get really good at anything, you need to practice a lot. It's a simple matter of neuroscience. To develop talent, you need to create and myelinate neural pathways associated with the motor skills involved in the activity. For many tasks, expertise doesn't happen until an athlete has completed about 10,000 hours of intentional practice. And doing anything except sleeping for 10,000 hours requires discipline. A gymnast, for example, might need to delay gratification by inhibiting the impulse to go to a movie with her friends when she needs to go back to the gym for afternoon training. And during training sessions, the gymnast may need to inhibit impulses to quit certain exercises that are physically demanding, but are necessary to develop the strength, flexibility, and balance needed to compete at the highest levels. And after practice, the gymnast may need to inhibit the impulse to eat junk food. So over the long term, getting really good at anything is almost impossible if you aren't able to delay gratification. But inhibitory control is critically important during competitions and performances as well. In fact, I believe inhibitory control is the underlying mechanism behind mental toughness. Jones and colleagues define mental toughness as the natural or developed psychological edge that enables you to cope better than your opponents with the many demands, competition, training, lifestyle, that sport places on a performer, and be more consistent and better than your opponent in remaining determined, focused, confident, and in control under pressure. To me, mental toughness is just what we call inhibitory control when we see it on a court, field, rink, or track. I'm someone who really likes to understand the big picture, and I find it easiest to understand the concept of mental toughness in reference to the performance style, which is a tool I developed about 10 years ago to help coaches and athletes better understand the psychology of sport performance. For those unfamiliar with the performance style, here's a quick summary to get you up to speed. Athletes tend to respond to success and failure in predictable ways, and that is because no matter where you live or what sport you play, success feels good and failure feels bad. When athletes succeed, they are pleased. They feel good. Their confidence increases, their motivation is enhanced by the thought that they can succeed, and their focus is on the task 
rather than trying to make sense of the past or worry about the future. And in this state of mind, they are in fact more likely to succeed. And they sometimes get energized as success starts to build. And occasionally, athletes will dial in, get in the zone, or experience flow, effortlessly performing in an almost euphoric state. But performances don't always go so well. In fact, because there are other people on the other team who also want to succeed, who may be just as talented as you, some performances can be a painful struggle. Making mistakes is not an enjoyable experience, especially when the mistakes are made in front of an audience. So athletes tend to experience frustration when they make mistakes. And when mistakes are made, confidence may erode somewhat and focus can drift to the past to try and understand why the mistake was made and to the future to the possible consequences of the mistake. And when additional mistakes are made, athletes become preoccupied with understanding the why of past mistakes and the what if of the possible consequences. So that instead of a steady single channel focus on the process of sport performance, their thoughts shift erratically between the past, the future, and attempts to focus on the present. And in this preoccupied state, confidence continues to disintegrate as additional mistakes are made. And many athletes in panicky desperation try to break down technical skills and try to control them as if they were learning well-learned skills for the first time. And when expert athletes try to reconstruct their motor skills, their performance tends to decrease further, thereby driving the downward spiral toward the point that giving up feels like the best option. Every athlete has a point at which they will dial out if things get too stressful. For those who don't have a lot of experience in competitive sport, the idea that adults would give up seems preposterous, but it happens even at the highest levels. Don't believe me? Look at Super Bowl 48 between the Seattle Seahawks and the Denver Broncos. Or check out the Spain-Netherlands match or the Germany-Brazil match during the 2014 World Cup. And if you watch sports, any sport in any country at any level you will see this process unfold because it is human nature to respond to successive failures with frustration, then preoccupation, and ultimately dialing out if things get bad enough. The performance style illustrates the way in which athletes naturally respond to failure, but it is the ghost of what might be, not the ghost of what will be, to use a Dickens metaphor because the performance dial is not fatalistic. The frustration, preoccupation, dialed out sequence summarizes what usually happens to athletes unless they have the self-awareness to recognize the downward spiral and have the self-control to disregard the perceived failure, to trust their training, and to focus on the process. So to me, the essence of mental toughness is this. Mentally tough athletes are those who are able to inhibit their impulses to quit. They are able to shield themselves from the emotional pull of failure and are able to avoid giving in to the belief that the situation is hopeless. But most of the athletes that I have coached or have worked with as a sports psychology consultant are quite unaware of how they tend to respond to success and failure during competitions. And I was definitely the same way as an athlete. And that's why I find it pretty easy to relate to athletes who struggle to find solutions to their performance problems. And why I find it easy to empathize with athletes who can barely discuss their worst performances without breaking into tears. But while lack of awareness and lack of strategies can lead athletes to a pretty dark place, there's always hope. If someone cares about their sport deeply enough to get to that place, I get excited about their untapped potential because I know they're willing to work and they're enthusiastic about their sport. They just aren't aware of the ways in which mistakes influence their mindset, their confidence, motivation, and focus. But once they understand the temptations that come with repeated failures, we're able to find ways to deal with these temptations. Waiting 15 minutes for a chance to eat an extra marshmallow is difficult for preschoolers 
because it's always tempting to reach for what is in front of you, even if it isn't the best outcome. But preschoolers who were able to delay gratification were not less tempted to eat the marshmallow. They were just better equipped to deal with the temptation. Being mentally tough doesn't mean you aren't tempted to give up sometimes. It just means you don't give in to the temptation. Enduring mistakes and failure while competing in a task that you care deeply about can be painful, and suffering probably isn't too strong a word. So when things get bad, it can be extremely tempting to give up, to ask for a sub, or simply stop trying. Some of the kids in the marshmallow studies who were able to delay gratification came up with some pretty creative strategies, like distracting themselves by singing or playing with toys in the room, or closing their eyes or looking away from the marshmallow. One kid even sat on his marshmallow, out of sight, out of mind. The kids who were able to wait the full 15 minutes were able to inhibit their impulse to give in to the temptation to just grab the marshmallow. When athletes are unable to inhibit the natural impulses that come with mistakes, their mindset shifts from frustration to preoccupation to the point where they are willing to dial out. Their mental strength is exhausted and they're unable to put up a fight. Or to put it differently, they're unwilling to endure the pain of perceived failure any longer. They raise the white flag, throw in the towel, or tap out in order to expedite a seemingly inevitable outcome so that they can get out of the situation because they no longer believe in their ability to change the situation. Which brings us to a follow-up to Michelle's original marshmallow studies in which researchers at the University of Rochester conducted similar experiments, but before the children were given the choice of an immediate reward now or an even more attractive award later, the experiment made two promises to each participant to bring them some really neat art supplies that they could use and then bring them some really neat stickers they could have. For half the participants, the promises were fulfilled by the experimenter, but for the other half, the promises were broken. No art supplies, no stickers. So before the marshmallow task, Half the participants had reason to believe the experimenter, while the other half had reason to be skeptical of the experimenter's promise of a second marshmallow if they waited. Not surprisingly, those who had developed some degree of confidence in the experimenter waited four times longer than those who had reason not to trust the experimenter. So it wasn't just a matter of whether the preschoolers were able to wait, it was a matter of whether they were willing to wait. And those who had confidence in the experimenter were much more willing to use whatever willpower they could summon to inhibit their impulse to quit waiting and accept the less preferable outcome. Athletes who don't trust their training are much quicker to give up when things get bad than those who have confidence in themselves. Likewise, athletes who don't trust their teammates or their coaches are much quicker to give up as well. But athletes who have confidence in themselves, their coaches and their teammates, tend to be less likely to panic. They're able to hang in there and wait for their breaks to come. Just as a boxer with a good chin is able to take a few punches without getting knocked down, a mentally tough athlete is one who is able to withstand the psychological blow of each mistake so that they don't get to the point where they would dial out. The frustrated, preoccupied, dialed out spiral is what happens to athletes when they are unaware of the psychological pull of perceived failure or when athletes are unable to deal with the psychological impact of their mistakes. But every athlete has the free will to override the autopilot and take control of their thinking. Free will is like a muscle and exercising free will builds willpower or strength of will, if you will, or mental toughness, if you prefer. And just as the more patient preschoolers were able to come up with creative strategies to ward off the impulses to grab the marshmallow, mentally tough athletes find a way to inhibit the temptation to quit through thought control, relaxation techniques, imagery, 
or simply looking away from the marshmallow, so to speak, by deliberately focusing on something objective. Their breathing, the spin of the ball, the feel of their body moving, so that doubts and worries aren't able to find their way into the athlete's mind. But whatever strategies they use, mentally tough athletes are to some degree aware of the ways in which they typically respond to success and failure, and they are able to find ways to deal with these temptations. So call the underlying mechanism whatever you want, inhibitory control, delayed gratification, or willpower. Mental toughness is about not giving in to the temptation to give up on yourself or your teammates.